Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Lisa, and I'm here to share some words by Oswald Chambers. The first one is titled, Can a Saint Falsely Accuse God? All the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 Jesus' parable of the talents recorded in Matthew 25 verses 14 through 30 was a warning that it is possible for us to misjudge our capacities. This parable has nothing to do with natural gifts and abilities, but relates to the gift of the Holy Spirit as he was first given at Pentecost. We must never measure our spiritual capacity on the basis of our education or our intellect. Our capacity in spiritual things is measured on the basis of the promises of God. If we get less than God wants us to have, we will falsely accuse him as the servant falsely accused his master when he said, You expect more of me than you gave me the power to do. You demand too much of me, and I cannot stand true to you here, where you have placed me. When it is a question of God's Almighty Spirit, never say, I can't. Never allow the limitation of your own natural ability to enter into the matter. If we have received the Holy Spirit, God expects the work of the Holy Spirit to be exhibited in us. The servant justified himself while condemning his Lord on every point, as if to say, Your demand on me is way out of proportion to what you gave to me. Have we been falsely accusing God by daring to worry after he has said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you? Matthew 6, verse 33. Worrying means exactly what this servant implied. I know your intent is to leave me unprotected and vulnerable. A person who is lazy in the natural realm is always critical, saying, I haven't had a decent chance, and someone who is lazy in the spiritual realm is critical of God. Lazy people always strike out at others in an independent way. Never forget that our capacity and capability in spiritual matters is measured by and based on the promises of God. Is God able to fulfill his promises? Our answer depends on whether or not we have received the Holy Spirit. And that's the end of the first one. And the second one is titled, Don't Hurt the Lord. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? John 14, verse 9. Our Lord must be repeatedly astounded at us, astounded at how unsimple we are. It is our own opinions that make us dense and slow to understand. But when we are simple, we are never dense. We have discernment all the time. Philip expected the future revelation of a tremendous mystery, but not in Jesus the person he thought he already knew. The mystery of God is not in what is going to be. It is now. Though we look for it to be revealed in the future, in some overwhelming, momentous event, we have no reluctance to obey Jesus. But it is highly probable that we are hurting him by what we ask. Lord, show us the Father. John 14, verse 8. His response immediately comes back to us as he says, Can't you see him? He is always right here, or he is nowhere to be found. We look for God to exhibit himself to his children, 
but God only exhibits himself in his children. And while others see the evidence, the child of God does not. We want to be fully aware of what God is doing in us, but we cannot have complete awareness and expect to remain reasonable or balanced in our expectations of Him. If all we are asking God to give us is experiences and the awareness of those experiences is blocking our way, we hurt the Lord. The very questions we ask hurt Jesus because they are not the questions of a child. Let not your heart be troubled. Am I then hurting Jesus by allowing my heart to be troubled? If I believe in Jesus and his attributes, am I living up to my belief? Am I allowing anything to disturb my heart? Or am I allowing any questions to come in which are unsound or unbalanced? I have to get to the point of the absolute and unquestionable relationship that takes everything exactly as it comes from Him. God never guides us at some time in the future, but always here and now. Realize that the Lord is here now, and the freedom you receive is immediate. And that is the end of the second one. And the last one I'd like to share with you is titled, The Light That Never Fails. We all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. A servant of God must stand so very much alone that he never realizes he is alone. In the early stages of the Christian life, disappointments will come. People who used to be lights will flicker out, and those who used to stand with us will turn away. We have to get so used to it that we will not even realize we are standing alone. Paul said, No one stood with me, but all forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. 2 Timothy 4, verses 16 and 7. We must build our faith not on fading lights, but on the light that never fails. When important individuals go away, we are sad, until we see that they are meant to go, so that only one thing is left for us to do, to look into the face of God for ourselves. Allow nothing to keep you from looking with strong determination into the face of God regarding yourself and your doctrine. And every time you preach, make sure you look God in the face about the message first. Then the glory will remain through all of it. A Christian servant is one who perpetually looks into the face of God and then goes forth to talk to others. The ministry of Christ is characterized by an abiding glory of which the servant is totally unaware. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Exodus 34, verse 29. We are never called on to display our doubts openly or to express the hidden joys and delights of our life with God. The secret of the servant's life is that he stays in tune with God all the time. And that is the end of these words. I pray you all have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless each and every one of you. And I will see you either next video or in the air. Bye-bye.